Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the B&H virtual event space. Some of you may have been fortunate enough to see him in person, but today we're bringing you him virtually. Welcome back to what's the virtual event space now, Artie Morris. Artie, how you doing? Um, still breathing. <laughs> That's good. That's good for this event. We're happy to have you here. Artie is going to be talking about photographing bald eagles at Kachemek Bay in Homer, Alaska. So if you do have any questions about that, whether they pertain to bald eagles in particular, or even just birds, anything of flight in general, feel free to get those questions in. Artie is more than happy to take them throughout the entire seminar. So if you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. Otherwise, if you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you can use the comment section. But otherwise, I know Artie has a wonderful presentation ahead of us. So thank you for being here again, Artie. And that's it. The show is yours. Take it away. Perfect. Beautiful well, bald eagle. Howdy. And thank you, Scott. Thanks to the audience for dropping by. Scott mentioned I've done a bunch of these uh, in Manhattan at the event space. So this is a first for me doing this virtual for b &H, my good friends at b &H. I am Arthur Morris. I've been photographing birds for 39 years, coming up on 40 this August 7th of 2023. And whether you're using Canon or Nikon or Sony, I can teach you how to make better pictures of birds. And we'll be doing a lot of learning today. I'll be doing a lot of teaching and we should have a lot of fun along the way. I was a Canon Explorer of Light for 19 years. I was one of the original 55 and they were very, very generous. They sponsored my first big exhibit at the Peterson Institute in Jamestown, New York. And then they sponsored a second one uh, the Migratory Birds of North America on a Wing and a Prayer. That was hung at the National Zoo in Washington. For a, People tell me the pictures are still up from 20 years ago. Started off, of course, with film in 1983, made this picture somewhere in the late 80s. And it went on sort of to become uh, the signature image of my career. Great Blue Herons Courting, it was made with the Canon 800 millimeter f5.6 lens, a big bear of a lens. It had two uh, focusing knobs at the back. And catch this, 45 foot minimum focus. Unheard of today. We're so blessed with the gear that we have. So for me personally, I wish I never heard the word film for lots of reasons. And all the pictures in the original The Art of Bird Photography were created on film. And Canon kindly uh, sponsored part of the cost when I reprinted this in about, I don't know, 2000 something. Uh, they were, the used copies were selling for $475 on eBay. So again, Canon, super generous to me for 19 years. And a bit humorous when I did the digital follow-up, they refused to kick in any money towards the printing of the CDs because they said, our meters are perfect. And I said, well, not exactly. So we lost out there. The program for today, photographing bald eagles at Tachemac Bay. Now I gave Scott a lesson how to say that and he blew it. What are you going to do? Anyway, I've been up to Homer going up since early 2000s. And we're going to take care of a little bit of clerical stuff. If you learn one thing today, subscribe to the blog, www.burzazart-blog.com. You can email me from this one here. I think it says email Artie. We have a great used gear page in the Burzazart online store. Or you can email me at birdsisart at verizon.net. But do stay in touch, do write for advice. Anything's better than buying the wrong gear. b and after I got dumped by Canon, after 19 years, I was unceremoniously let go 
And there's all sorts of stuff on the internet about the things I did wrong, but it was just the usual political BS with Cannon. And the guy that was forced to fire me, Stephen in Glima, he was fired a couple of months later. So B&H picked up the ball and sponsored my exhibit at the Natural History Museum in San Diego. And that was one of those top 10 days of your life days for me. But our program today is about Homer and it does offer incredible opportunities in the red jacket is my good friend, Anita North and client friend, Greg Ferguson. And yes, we do bait the eagles with rose and herring. So before you have a cow, uh, this is one of my two captains for this year, Gabe. And we'll be seeing some of his fine work. He's very creative as far as picking locations. But the story of Homer's, the story of Homer and bald eagles goes way back, oh, I don't know, into the 80s. There was a lady named Jean Keen, and she lived in a tiny little shack in a campground. And she used to get fish, fish parts, guts, skeletons uh, from the filleted salmon and started feeding the eagles. And at the time, eagle populations were way down due to DTT. So she was pretty much a worldwide celebrity with her red hair. She was a, a former radio, rodeo hotshot in her younger days. And people would pay money to go in her backyard and photograph the eagles. You can see here, the sun's gonna be coming up to the right. You see some pink. So on sunny days, you were dead because you were photographing right into the sun. So I only spent one morning in Jean's backyard. And then after a while, ah, the best thing about Jean's backyard, I mentioned she, she was in the campground. So they had all of these pilings and the eagles coming around for food would perch on the pilings and you could put a bean bag or a pillow on your rental vehicle. She insisted that you stay in the car and make some neat shots especially with the birds calling. And people go, how'd you get that one? That was actually a tractor trailer truck parked in the background. So it's good that we get to choose our background by choosing our perspective carefully. And one thing is for sure, whatever you think about Gene feeding the birds for 30 or 40 years, bald eagle populations just increased tremendously uh, during her reign. Then there was a whole to do at Homer, there was a wildlife biologist. I think he worked for National Wildlife for the feds. And he was illegally keeping sandhill cranes in a pen on his backyard on the hill. He didn't like the concentration of eagles because once in a while an eagle would take one of his cranes. So he started this big deal about making, feeding eagles on the Homer spit against the law. So he went to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he submitted a long proposal, and they told him, that's bull, nothing you say in there is true. Then he went to the state, Alaska Fish and Game, submitted the same long proposal, and they said, well, that's nice, but nothing you say is true. Then he did a backdoor run, and he went to the town council of Homer, and he had an ordinance passed, because we had been uh, feeding the eagles around town, buying our own fish, and running workshops. This is my friend Weldon Lee. And in the early days, we used Flash. Since I've been to digital, I did, haven't used Flash in 15, 18 years. But we got some nice results with it, able to darken the background, light the bird. Here's another one from Gene's campground with Flash and a nice series with Flash of Bald Eagle Calling. Again, from the car. Now we have a great bean bag called the Blub that I designed and have manufactured myself. So this is looking out over uh, part of the harbor at Homer, and there's probably 20 or 30 bald eagles here. And again, we would buy our own fish. We didn't, we, we photographed a little bit in Gene's backyard. I started bringing groups up there. This is with the old Canon 400 millimeter F5.6 
call that the toy lens. That was my first autofocus lens. And we had some opportunities for flight, but one of the reasons that I was disenchanted with Canon was that when you had the bird flying towards you, they would always be sharp on the feet. The autofocus simply couldn't keep up with the birds, uh, when they, especially when they were flying at you. And it wasn't all that after. It wasn't all that accurate when they were flying from side to side. But once in a while, we managed a good one. This is with the Canon 70 to 200. And what I love about this was I called it out to the group. I see the opportunity. The birds are flying in from across Kachemak Bay to come to Homer. And I said, take a wide lens, zoom out, put the bird in the upper right, and see if you get a nice wing position. I remember this day, minus five degrees with about a 25 knot wind. And after I photographed for half an hour, I went in the car, turned on the heater and cried as my fingers thawed out. It was so painful. Notice the little ice on the bird's bill tip. We started exploring around town. This was for, on a discarded Christmas tree, gray, count, gray crowned. Rosie Finch, slow down, buddy. And we stay at Land's End Resort, best hotel in town. And this is in a, a this is on a snow pile, just to the left of the entrance, Northwest and Crow, in the snow. And one day we had a group, and we just had all the hamburgers come out. And a friend, Heather Forcier, was up there. And we were just about to eat. They put all the burgers in front of us. And Heather calls out, oh, my God, Emperor Goose. And we just left the burgers there for two hours and went to photograph this incredibly rare bird for North America. Then when they finally got the ordinance passed, that feeding the birds on Homer Spit was illegal, and that was really one of the world's biggest crock. We started hiring water taxis. This is my friend Gart. I don't use this boat anymore. It's a little confining for five photographers plus the leader, but you get the idea what's going on here. He's chopping up the herring if it's not fully thawed and tossing it to the fish. So the landing shots like this are a total piece of cake, vary our backgrounds. And then we work on the birds getting ready to dive and turning upside down. And this is a young eagle, about five years old. It takes six or seven years for them to reach full mat maturity and get the pure white head and the pure white tails. One of the great advantages of being in the boat is that we can control our background. So there are lots of cliff walls. The captains and the mates are great at throwing the bait where I want it. And there's our beautiful backgrounds. These are all with Canon. These are old pictures from the 2000, 2006, eight, sort of like that. And then zooming out for this glaucous wing gull to get the distant headland. Once we started going on the boat, we started making landings at different spots. So we'd get some variety aside from flight. We could get the birds perched. So you'll notice I have the bird a little centered with more room in front of the bird. And here's a young bird perch. And now, since he's looking to our right, I'm gonna put them on the left side of the frame. And it's easy getting close to the birds. So this is what I call the vertical front end composition. And what you wanna do is give the birds an inch behind the feet down here. And you know, people say, why didn't you zoom out? Well, you're seeing much more detail with vertical front end composition than with whole bird portraits. Once in a while, you can get nice juxtapositions, two adult eagles here. This was when I was with Gart, and I was actually using the tripod with the Canon 800. 
and a 1.4 teleconverter, but this is the 800 uh, EF lens. So it was an autofocus lens. And then skipping way ahead, the Sony 70 to 202. Amazing, what a great replacement for the first version. Much faster focusing, works great with both teleconverters. And the idea of a juxtaposition is generally to focus on the close bird and have the bird in the distance just in the right spot and nicely out of focus. A codfish was placed on the beach by Gart. We sat on the beach choosing our perspective, a young bird, probably in its first winter plumage. And that's with the short lens, maybe the 100 to 400. Last year with Gabe, we got a road killed moose carcass from the mainland, trucked it over by boat and placed it on a gravel beach. And strangely, we only had one bird come in, at least while we were there. Next day it was picked clean. We had much better luck with a road killed hare, Arctic hare. Lots of birds, and this is with a 70 to 200. So you sit down and the birds come to you. Once we're walking on the land, we can get some neat perches and work them, different compositions and different lenses. It's probably the 100 to 400 or 70 to 200, and then probably a 500 with the teleconverter. Notice how nicely we blur the background with the longer lenses. That's not a function of aperture, it's a function of the relative distance from the bird to the background. And good to throw in some verticals. Back in the days when you could sell a photograph here and there, we'd wanna leave room at the top for the magazine title. Again, the captains and or the mates are throwing frozen herring or thawed herring. Uh, and we love to get out an hour before sunset, find a great spot, usually in China Poot Bay, and do the silhouettes. Now, Artie, I just want to jump in, especially we've got some, we've got some birds in flight here. And I think this question yeah. that we got asked is uh pertinent here. David, who's joining us on Vimeo, wanted to ask why you find it important to use wind in your favor when photographing birds in flight. Well, let me back up a little tiny bit here. Yeah. The birds are always going to land into the wind, take off into the wind, and when they get on the beach, if there's any breeze, they're all gonna face into the wind in the same direction. So in general, you want the wind behind you. And when it's sunny, you need the light behind you. So in the mornings, when the sun comes up in the east, northeast, southeast, you want a wind somewhere from the east. So the wind is behind you and the birds are flying at you. Have a group come to Florida, all excited to go out. They look and they see the beautiful sky with, at night, we will start out very early with stars and clear skies. And sometimes I'm forced to say to them, it's gonna be terrible today. And they go, what are you talking about? Well, a front just went through, the wind is from the Northwest, the sun is coming up in the Southeast, and every bird is gonna be flying away from us, landing away from us and the light. And when they land on the beach, they're gonna face away from us. So we need the wind and the sun together. On cloudy days, it's much better because uh, we can photograph in almost any direction. So yeah, wind and sun together here, wind behind us, sun behind us, perfect. Cloudy doesn't matter and stop me when we get to where we are, where we were. There yes. you go, we're right there. There you go, thank you. 
So did it sound like I answered the question, Scott? I think so. Uh, if, if, if not, then David, let us know. We'll, we'll try to clarify more. Wind and sun behind you when it's sunny, when it's cloudy, you have much more leeway. Get the wind behind you and let the birds come to you. So the sunsets can be spectacular at Kachemak Bay. There are no sunrises with color because the sun comes up behind the mountains. From a spectacular evening in 22. And one of the things that you'll find if you get up there is that for the silhouettes to be successful, you have to see the bird's heads. I have hundreds, thousands of beautiful silhouettes, razor sharp with the high frame rate cameras where the bird's head is not visible and those all go in the trash. And then this was a crazy night. This is Augustine Volcano giving off a little steam. And from a zillion years ago, probably 2003 or so, we had an eagle at sunset. And of course, one of the things I love about digital photography is that you have control. So from the same raw file, the same negative, you can go this way, same exact photo, just a matter of your interpretation. I love trying to create pleasing blurs. Here's a case I'm probably at a 30th of a second. And I've panned perfectly with the bird. So we have a sharp eye and a pan blurred background. Sometimes I'll go a little slower, even down to an eighth of a second, a 30th. And if you don't pan perfectly, you're not gonna get the sharp eye. So I'll spend a little time in Photoshop to bring the eye up. And if you get the moment of the splash, you'll notice I haven't showed one photograph of a bald eagle with a frozen herring. If the bird catches the fish, I quit shooting. It's just my personal take. Lots of people like them, I don't. <clears throat> More pan blur. And of course we get to choose our backgrounds by what's reflected off the wall, the cliffs in front of us. Here's one in open water. This was at an eighth of a second. So my rule for blurs is the slower your shutter speed, the fewer keepers you're gonna make, but your chance of winning an international contest is increased. This one actually made the finals of BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year, but it didn't do anything. This is a recent one with Sony, bald eagle starting to dive. And you see the pan here is vertical as I followed the bird down. Two juvenile pan blurs, again, with the beautiful wall. And here you see I'm zooming from lower left, upper right, and managed to get a sharp eye and a sharp eye here in open water. And the glaucous wing gulls can make some really cool pleasing blurs. I should mention that if you're interested in learning the different techniques in the Birds of Art online store, you can access that through the blog. I did a guide with Denise Polito called the Guide to Pleasing Blurs. One of my favorites is a drowned birch forest from uh, the big earthquake and the trees are still standing. And this is with the 800 and the 1.4 on a tripod and a vertical pan blur. And messing around in the harbor. One of the neat things in the harbor is that there are some of the boats from, oh, I knew senility would strike somewhere, Deadliest Catch, the Time Bandit, and several others are, spend their winters uh, in the harbor at Homer. So when I got let go unceremoniously for no reason as a Canon Explorer of Light, I stayed with Canon for four years and I advertised it and I pitched the Canon stuff. They were very generous to me. I tried to take the high road. Finally switched to Nikon, quickly got the Nikon 600. 
This is made with the D850 and a 1.4X teleconverter, roseate spoonbill at Alifaya Banks with my good friend James Shadle, and the 500PF with the D850 in Chile, Inca Turn, and a black browed albatross in the Falklands. And in 2019, it was a bucket list trip, ridiculously expensive. Got down to the tip of South America, to Ushuaia, Argentina. Got on a Russian icebreaker. Sailed actually northeast the first day because of the big storm. And then southeast for three days. It seemed like we weren't going to get close enough to land everyone on the same day. But they did a, a, a lecture, and the boat was lurching. And they made it close enough for everybody to land by Russian helicopter in a single day at Snow Hill Island in Antarctica. And it was a trip of a lifetime. So I relied completely on my Nikon gear. This is a much maligned lens, the new version of the 80 to 400. And I was so thrilled to find these four chicks walking with an adult. And I was on my way back. It was a two mile walk in each direction from the landing pad for the helicopter to the colony. I made a couple of pictures with the blue ice in the background and the battery went dead on my D850. I had about six fully charged batteries in my vest and I was so nervous I couldn't find them. 80 to 400 Emperor Penguin in the snow actually cooling. We were there, it was a heat wave and the chicks were dying by the dozens by the third day. I love doing my crazy abstract stuff on adult Emperor Penguin and crash, the French word for nursery. Obviously this one king penguin did not have all these chicks on its own, but they gather and they serve as sort of a nursemaid for big groups. And the chicks are too, too cute. Emperor penguin. <clears throat> I spend a ton of time in San Diego doing the brown pelicans. I have three trips coming up December and January. The middle one sold out. Pacific race of brown pelican, same birds in Florida, but with the fire engine red bill pouches and olive green at the base. And in the rain with digital on a windy afternoon, we know where the birds sit. And I mentioned we get up early on all the IPTs. Here's the blue, pink, purple sky to the west on a clear morning. And tons of flight opportunities. This is with the 70 to 200 and the 1.4. And of course, I haven't even mentioned the Sony A1 yet. I started Sony with the A92. And when the A1 came out, sold my A92s and my A9 and my A7R4 and my A7R3. And now I'm the proud owner of three Sony A1s. And if you use B&H to purchase it, you get, and you use my link. So write me when you get a new gear and you get free entry, entry into my Sony A1 group. We actually send you all my settings to load your camera and teach you how to use it in two minutes. So I was in San Diego. I had used Canon for 33 or four years. I used Nikon for two, two and a half years. And then I borrowed the Sony 100 to 400 and an A9. And these Brands Cormorants are landing straight at us full speed ahead. And my good friend Patrick Sparkman and I were amazed. Almost every picture was razor sharp on the eye. So when it came time to get the A1, I suddenly became the flight photographer that I always thought I could be, making really good flight image, images consistently. 
I have a simple AF system with the A1. I just use two different AF modes. This is with the 600 handheld in Texas, on the Texas coast. I'll get the name in a second, Padre Island at sunset. I'm going to stop know. you there. I'm going to stop you there, Artie. Let's go back to that last <laughs> to that last image because Elizabeth asked a question that I think it would tie into this perfectly. She asked, why do you like getting pictures of birds in silhouette? Why do I like them? Yeah. I dig silhouettes. A lot of people hate them and they just say they're cliches. I think they're dramatic. They give you a chance to go for all these different color palettes. But of course, it's personal taste uh, as far as silhouettes. Some people will never even point their lens at a silhouette situation. And there are other people in a similar vein who would never in their life try to create a pleasing blur. They go, I hate all blurs. And I go, that's fine. I like them because on occasion, they get you honored in big international contests and they're pleasing to the eye. And sometimes we get folks on an instructional photo tour who profess to hate blurs, we teach them how to do it. And all of a sudden, all they want to do is blurs. So yeah, it's personal taste. I love them because of the color, the drama, the starkness. And uh, they're fun. So I'm staying out late and getting up early. I hope that answers your question, Elizabeth. Yeah, that's a, it's an opinion question. So as long as that's your opinion, then I think we're good. Thanks for the question, Elizabeth. So here I am in Texas, and now I'm at Indian Lake Estates and I'm standing by a canal and I have a great recycling program for roadkill. So I'll get a, a possum, a raccoon, and get some fish from the guy in town. When I get a little east or northeast wind and some cloudy, cloudy light, I will put the bait out at about half hour after sunrise. Sometimes I'll sit in my car and when the first vulture comes in, I'll sneak down to my lens. So I'm photographing the black and turkey vultures pretty much at eye level as they come in. And again, you need the wind behind you unless you like bird butts. Cloudy day at Lake Blue Cypress. This osprey just circled around and around and around. And after 20 years of living not far from a place called Stick Marsh, I discovered it and went two years ago and found incredible action with incoming roseate spoonbills. And then last year they had a big construction project and I'm hoping things get back to normal in March of 2023. But it's great to be able to have almost every flight shot sharp on the eye if you have an A1, I strongly recommend that you find out about getting in my A1 group and also bird eye tracking was improved with firmware update 1.3.1. Another new place I discovered is Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Ran a couple of trips there. I'll be going, I think, in June or early July this year. And phenomenal flight photography. The birds carrying all kinds of prey items and fish for the young. And then I got a big step stool, a super tall nine-foot tripod, and stood up with the Sony 600 and the 2X. And autofocus performs at 1,200 millimeter just as it does at 200, so incredible technology. And I should mention, to be fair to everybody else, Canon with the R5, the R6, the R7, they are in the ball game with their mirrorless cameras. The Nikon Z6 and 7 were pretty good. The Z9 is insane. I don't think either of them are quite as good as the A1, as far as bird eye face detection, but certainly they're light years ahead of the DSLRs. The one thing I hated with Nikon 
was in order to change your focus area, you had to hold the lever down on the front left of the camera. And that's just insane. Now you can program all the buttons in different ways. So DSLRs are really on the way out and mirrorless rules the world of bird photography for sure. So we get back to Homer and this has been my boat for the last couple of years with Gabe on the Smoky Bay. So it's a big roomy work boat, lots of room for six photographers. And now you have the A1 with 30 frames per second. And actually come back here for a second. <clears throat> If you shot this with the meter, as Canon suggests you would, it'd be two, two, two and a third, two and two third stops underexposed because the cameras have no idea on a cloudy white sky day that they have to open up at least two stops, two and a third, two and two third stops. So we'll teach you to get the right exposure on cloudy days in white sky conditions. And there are plenty of those in Homer. And we'll even teach you to turn the camera on end and shoot vertical original bank shots. It's challenging, but it's fun when you succeed and you get lots more pixels on the bird. Most folks, when you see verticals like this, vertical bank shots, they're cropped from horizontal originals. And with the high frame rate cameras and the incredible autofocus of all the mirrorless bodies, just get zillions of great flight poses. I said the other day, we were teaching at Fort DeSoto last week. And I said, geez, just think, I just edited a 2000 image folder in 10 minutes in Photo Mechanic. And I deleted 1,900 pictures and 1,800 of those were perfectly sharp flight shots that I would have given my right hand for 10 years ago, five years ago. So you really need to improve your editing skills to avoid filling countless hard drives. And I am a ruthless editor. I don't go out the next day unless I've edited all the slides from the day before. On rare occasion, I might get behind for a day, but I have people who were with me in 2020 to Homer and 2022, who will email and say, gee, I only have 4,000 good Eagle pictures to go through. And one of the fun things is sitting in the restaurant at Land's End with the computer on and going through hundreds of Eagle shots and teaching people the wing positions we're looking for. And one of the things I didn't mention aside from the need to be much higher than the camera's meter is that when we have snow on the ground, the light is reflected up and you get these beautifully lit underwings with lots of detail. Here's one steaming right at you. So when I was shooting Canon and Nikon to some degree, these would be razor sharp on the feet, but now with all the mirrorless bodies. So you speaking of exposure, one thing I didn't mention is that Sony has a feature called zebras. Those are like blinkies that you see on your JPEGs. Only Sony users, if their cameras are set up, up properly, can see the zebras live in the viewfinder. And the way we teach you to set up your A9, your A92, your A1, is to have the zebras at, the zebras at such a level with ISO on the rear thumb dial, that when you see faint zebras on the highlights, that's gonna give you a perfect exposure. I use a program called Raw Digger that lets you evaluate the raw file exposures and it's really scary. Whereas with Canon and Nikon, you need to take a test exposure, check your histogram, check your blinkies, and then adjust your exposure if you need to. So that's a huge advantage for Sony. I don't know why Canon offers it for video, which is great, but it's ridiculous that the other company, companies haven't offered it for stills. 
No, Arthur, I want to I want to jump into a few questions we've got over here. Great. Uh, first one is from Earl, who wanted to ask, have you used the Sony 200 to 600 yet? And would you share your opinions on it? Earl, be patient. <laughs> we have a whole section coming up on the two to six. Beautiful. So and, we'll and, and how it's changed so many lives. And I'll talk about that in five minutes. Great. Excellent. So we'll go on. We'll go on to Garrison here, who says he's got a Sony A1, loves it, couldn't be happier, loves Alaska as well, but wants to know from your perspective, what is the one bird or birds that you dream or hope to capture that you haven't shot yet? Well, up until 2019, I would have said Emperor Penguin, but I've been there. And one of the crazy parts of my career is that I get as much joy out of photographing the sandhill cranes by my home that I've done a couple of thousand days since I moved here in 2020, as I do photographing some exotic bird. For me, it's about making good pictures that are sharp, that look the way I want them, and that other people find at least somewhat interesting. Uh, Right now, I'm on a streak of like 227 days with a new blog post. And almost every blog post features one to eight images. And almost all of those are, are new and fairly recent. So I'm much more, if you ask me where I'd love to go and photograph, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to Australia, but I'd love to photograph that pelican down there with the giant yellow eye ring. And I've really, I'll talk more about this near the end. I've been so blessed in my life that I don't have any great desire to photograph anything other than to get out tomorrow, which will not happen because there's some big tropical storm uh, coming through with heavy winds. And even then, if it's pouring rain, I'll go down, put the wind at my back and shoot out of the car uh, with the big beanbag, the blub. Awesome. Now, Earl, did have one other follow-up question that maybe you can answer now. Um, in terms of shutter speeds, what shutter speed or speeds do you prefer for eagle flight for sharp shots and not just getting, you know, a blur? That is an excellent question, Earl. Thank you. And I've been remiss about not mentioning it. When we shot film, we were thrilled to have enough light to shoot flight at one five hundredth of a second. Not to mention in the early days, we had to focus manually. And in about 15 years of focusing manually with film, I had a grand total of zero sharp flight shots. Other people were very proficient at it. Then for a long time, we would go for a 1600th or a 2000th of a second for flight. And I actually, if you go back, Earl, to the blog about a week ago, I did a post called Minimum Shutter Speeds for Hand Holding, and we did the whole discussion. Anyway, now with the modern cameras, the modern mirrorless cameras, and Topaz Denoise, you can make great flight shots at ISO 4000, ISO 8000, ridiculous. So I'm going to often, even on cloudy days, be going for a 3200th of a second or a 4000th of a second. And the first step in my workflow is to do topaz denoise on its own layer. But there are times when I just don't want to raise the ISO to ridiculous levels. And I might try a 500th of a second or a thousandth or one twelve fiftieth. And at those intermediate flight shutter speeds, you'll get a little blurring of the wingtips. I generally like that. And there are times when you we are at a four thousandth of a second and a bird is landing and you'll have some blur in the wingtip. So that never bugs me. The other thing I should mention as far as technique is that 99.9 .9 of my flight shots are made at the wide open aperture, period. Because it's the what you see is what you get rule. All of our viewing when we look through the viewfinder is at the wide open aperture. Birds in flight are generally a good distance away. and if the whole bird looks so sharp in the looks sharp in the frame from bill tip to feet, there's no reason at all to stop down. The reason 
The rare times you'll find me stopping down is when I'm shooting a small bird point blank, 14, 15 feet at 840, where I'll want to stop down to 8, 9, 10, 11 from 5, 6, because depth of field is at a minimum when you are near minimum focusing distance. But when the bird is at a good distance, go to your photo pills website and just put the numbers in and you'll see how much depth of field you get with birds at a distance. Did I forget the original question, Earl? No. Uh, Scott, I think I got it. Yeah, shutter speed. You got it. Nailed it. Okay, we ready to go? Let's keep moving. Thank you, Earl. So here we have an adult and then a young bird in flight landing and a young bird over the boat on a white sky day. <clears throat> Once you're photographing a few days or a few years, now in addition to getting the birds in the sky, you're want, gonna wanna try to add other elements of composition. So we were tossing some herring and eagles were coming from afar. And I said to the group, 70 to 200 deadly lens, zoom out a little bit and try and get the bird just above the grasses, the beautiful beach grasses. One of my favorite Homer images, and another thing, <clears throat> looking for background. So this is a relatively distant bird. It was probably the two to 600 with a little mountain, frozen mountain lake and some mountains in the background. So adding other elements of composition. One afternoon, one thing that people need to understand for all bird photography is if you have this cloudy, bright day and the sun is trying to get through, it's not quite making it, you can shoot sharp backlit pictures where the raw file has a white sky. And when you bring it into Photoshop, you can almost always get some beautiful gold color. And there's a, that's a lesson a lot of people just don't get. So the sun wasn't out and the, the rest of the group was at the back of the boat photographing birds front lit. I stayed at the back because the wind was better. It was the wrong wind for flight, but I had the birds coming at me, photographing the sun was just out of frame, getting the head, getting the nice pose. And then when the sun came out, the wind shifted to the same direction as the sun. So I ran in the back and we had this incredible situation where the eagles were flying against the hillside that was had a big fog bank on it when I got an adult and a juvenile bird. So again, these don't happen by taking one frame. So a lot of times on an instructional photo tour, I'll get people and you go, well, I don't like to do so much editing. So I have my camera on five frames per second or low. And I go, that's insanity. You need to be at your maximum frame rate, 30 frames per second for the A1. And I, I'm conservative when I shoot. I'm not gonna shoot at every bird that flies by, but I'm gonna look for good situations. When I have the bird filling half the frame in a good situation and I've got focus, then I'm gonna just hold the shutter button down and shoot bursts of five to 25 images. And every one I can assure you will be different. And the great part, with Sony and the Z9 and the R5 all set up properly. We have guides for the Z9, the R5, the R6, all of the earlier Sony bodies in the Burgess Art Store, the camera user's guides. We will teach you, we mentioned getting the right exposure on cloudy days when you need to add two or more stops. On sunny days, the meter will generally be close and if you're shooting Nikon or Canon, we'll teach you how to examine your histograms and come up with perfect exposures. A little easier, again, with Sony Zebras and all sorts of flight poses and just dramatic stuff when the sun is shining. And this is a rare one. I saw these two birds coming and I fired a burst of about 12. And in one image, the birds were exactly on the same plane. and two sharp eyes, rare. 
If you look in the lower left here, you see the frozen waterfalls. And we took this shot after we did our waterfall shooting. And there were 42 eagles here uh, on this nice headland and beautiful formations. I've actually photographed chert rocks, chert in the lower left. And here's the shots we're going for. We do these sometimes from the boat at high tide. The birds going after the tossed bait with the frozen waterfall in the background. And in 22, I spotted this one. So much about bird photography is envisioning squares, rectangles around what you see. So this was the two to 600 at relatively high ISO. I chose my perspective so there wouldn't be any merges on it. And there was a guy in the group who will remain unnamed. And he saw me doing some cleanup work on my images. And he said, I'm a purist. I don't clean anything up. And then I saw him working on this picture, the same shot that I had after I pointed it out to the group. And I said, hey, what happened to that ugly piece of straw and that little white thing? He said, oh, I removed them. So much for a purist. I don't want to hear it. I try to keep the natural history of each image the same while doing cleanup to my heart's content. So this is five eagles on a rock. This is five eagles on a rock, a little more pleasing. And you notice that there's a little yellow color cast. So I actually glory in sitting at the laptop and doing the image optimizations. And if you go to the Birds of Zod online store, we have a whole bunch of Photoshop videos. And the complete workflow uh, from raw conversion in Photoshop to all my image cleanup tools, the whole nine yards, a zillion Photoshop tricks. And get some incredible stuff. Don't worry, the photographer was not in danger. Uh, telephoto lenses compress the elements of the image design. So this eagle is not anywhere near attacking the poor client. And that client bought his 4028 and his 604 Sony and client kindly loaned it to me because I had always said 4028s are worthless for bird photography. And after making this picture and making a nice landscape, and again, it's all about seeing the world in these boxes, in these rectangular frames, according, on, according to your focal length. So I bought myself a 4028. This is with the 70 to 200, but I've been using, if you visit the blog, and there's, in the top right corner, there's a little search box with, you can put in, 400 millimeter F28 GM, and it'll bring you to 25 blog posts. Anyway, this is Homer, and this is one of my very favorite perches. <coughs> Excuse me. It's in a little out of the way cove, and when it's snowing, it's brilliant. Same perch, 70 to 200 is all you need. I got hundreds of unprocessed keepers. And of course, the Holy Grail is getting snow. <coughs> and right now I have a ticklish throat, bear with me. This one was used on National Wildlife Federation greeting cards for years. Still make, make a sale to them every couple of years. They still continue to use it, you get a check. And with falling snow, you can vary your shutter speeds. This one was at a 60th of a second and a distant bird. This one, probably a 500th of a second. And some of the autofocus cameras, the, even the, the mirrorless have a little trouble getting through the snow. We can teach you a trick if you have a lens that has direct manual focus, you can pre-focus on the bird and get through the heavy snow. And you'll see that we like the snow with the cliff backgrounds. But even in a heavy snow with a white background snow, you can see the effects of the snow against the eagle's black feathers. And this is one of my all time favorites. There's a bald eagle small in the frame here. 
with the Canon 70 to 200 and the 100 to 400 on this beautifully colored cliff. And I never entered this in the contest, even though it's sort of like a Surat with the pointless effect. There was another eagle right in the middle of the frame that couldn't even tell what it was. So I could never enter it in a contest because I hated that one so much. This was just on a ripping cold day with the snow blowing. You've heard it. Yeah, worse conditions, great pictures. And fresh snow with the 70 to 200. And then zooming out, that's the headland of Homer Spit in the background. Zooming out to get the grasses. Bird coming to the bait. Glaucus wing gulls, there are lots of them. We can do them sharp. We can do them on cloudy days, on sunny days, going in the water. Rarely we'll get some backlit opportunities. And one thing I miss about Canon is HDR Art Vivid. This is about a four frame stitched pano with the Canon 70 to 200 and Art Vivid in-camera HDR. There are some nice opportunities for landscapes up in Homer. Some of the other stuff we get are sea otter. This is my favorite one. He swam right by the boat with the 800 lens. On the way back to Harbor, Harbor Seal. Rare, 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 super rare North American bird, yellow-billed loon. Uh, last year, 2022, I brought the 600. I brought it on the boat once. Made some pictures of Barrow's golden eye. And this landscape at 840 millimeters, again, learning to picture the scene in rectangles of the lens that you have in your hand. <clears throat> some years we get lots of rosy finches, so we'll set up perches and feeders in town, just sprinkling some seed about from the balcony of my room at Land's End on a snowy day. Big flocks of rock sandpipers in some years and skillful boat handling by Gabe. Get a single bird. I love these shipscapes. This was a big tugboat that was moored right next to us and going out at night in a blizzard, the 70 to 200. If you have some extra days, you run into a guy named Steve Friend and photograph in his backyard, Boreal Chickadee, Red Pole. To get the name of the bird, male pine grosbeak, that's the female, and the male at a feeder setup. And finally, back to Earl's question 200 to 600, greatest thing since sliced bread. I've taught. 80-year-old men and women who were new to Sony, urged them to buy this 200 to 600, change their life and get an A1. And they're making good pictures in three minutes. So these are all 200 to 600, cloudy day, get zebras on the head, sunny day, same perch. Sun came out, weather's changing. The birds are so tame, you sit down, you toss a little bit of fish, 200 to 600. Again, sunny, cloudy, doesn't matter with zebras. As far as your crop choices, this one works as a two by three horizontal or a square crop. And again, 200 to 600, same bird, another beautiful juvenile in the snow. And one of the raps people say is, oh, it's a 6.3 lens. So the background's gonna be too sharp because you're at 6.3, not F4. And I go, it doesn't matter. The determining factor as to the, the degree of blurring is the distance from the bird to the background. In this case, it was 15 feet and I was 10 feet from the bird. 200 to 600, great minimum focusing distance of about seven feet. And going vertical and using tracking zone, the bird takes off, marginal shutter speed, a thousandth of a second, focused, little motion blur, Topaz Sharp and AI cleaned that up beautifully. 200 to 600, staying back and getting the distant headlands and then getting closer and taller and shooting all water background and then getting 10 feet at 600 millimeters. 
and another one on a cloudy day, and then zooming out to 200 millimeters to get this calling eagle. And if you're standing in the right spot with the 200 to 600 on a sunny day and a merganza flies by, at least you have a chance. I hope to see at least a few of you in Homer. You can email me from the blog. I'm gonna close by saying that I've had a blessed life, seven or eight trips to Antarctica and the Falklands, king penguins up the kazoo. I've done Japan three or four times. My Galapagos trip next August is sold out. I'll be going back once more if I'm alive in 2024. And I do a lot of hard work keeping myself fit and keeping my blood sugar under control. This summer, I was blessed getting back to my soul place, the East Pond at Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. I saw a marble god with there in 1977, as I've written often. I had no idea that seeing that single bird was gonna change the remainder of my adult life for the good, but it did. And this year we were there and on a beautiful morning, this snapping turtle came out of the lagoon like some creature. And the big secret for a lot of this stuff is getting low. So I sat in the muck, but there's no place like home. I swim now, I'm swimming about a mile and two, two swims twice a day. I have the breeding cranes. This is Sony 100 to 400 and the A7R4, totally tame babies. They accepted me. I was there when this bird hatched. Best place in the world to photograph white mouth day flower is my front yard in spring. And my macro rig now is the Canon 180 millimeter lens with an A1 and a Metabones adapter. One last eagle image with a final processing tip. I processed this image and while I compared the processed image, the optimized image with the raw file, I said, oh my God, I screwed up the color. There was a big yellow cast to the white head, selected the white head, worked on a layer, control U and reduce the saturation on the whites, get a nice white head, 200 to 600, deadly. Speaking of the devil, there it is, my electric motion gloves, heated gloves, only ones in the world at work. You've been a group, I appreciate the questions, a nice group. Huge thanks to Stephanie, Jason, Danny, and especially Scott Jolson, who helped me set this whole thing up. And I hope you enjoy your dinner. I'm having some fresh tuna and hope to see you up there. God bless. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Artie. Thank you so much. Tons of great information. We got a few questions before we completely let you go. I know, I know you want to probably go for another swim. Um, no, it's freezing <laughs> out in black. Oh, it's cold. All right. Well, in, in that case, we'll keep you in a little longer. <laughs> uh, Earl, Earl wanted to know, uh, actually on the topic of, you know, you mentioned the yellow, the yellow kind of on the white head. He said, how do you deal with the white heads being washed out on bald eagles in sunny conditions? He's been trying to underexpose by a stop or two with a little bit of success. Well, that's a question everybody wants to know. <clears throat> because bald eagles, adults are black and white, you mu must push your histogram as far to the right as you can without overexposing the whites. I'll say it again. You wanna get the maximum detail in the dark feathers. So you're gonna expose all the way to the right. So for me, the combination of Sony zebras and that program I mentioned called Raw Digger, we sell a Raw Digger guide. The, the program is cheap. Learning how to use it'll cost you, I don't know, 30 or 40 bucks for the guide. But as long as your whites are not overexposed in raw digger, and it's the only thing that's not gonna lie to you, the photomechanic, photomechanic histogram, the histogram on the back of your camera, the histogram in Photoshop, they're all lying to you. They're based on the JPEG and they're gonna show overexposure where there is none. So since Earl asked another good question, I will direct him to a video we have for, I don't know, 10 or 20 bucks, called saving the whites. 
So after you expose your whites correctly, right to the edge of overexposure, then you can use linear burns in Photoshop. Uh, you learn how to use your sliders, the highlight slider, the white slider, pulling it down to restore detail. And the one thing that bugs me is that lots of folks think that white should always have detail. When you photograph a, a bald eagle with a white head or any bird in low light, you're not going to have a bunch of fine feather detail. It's just not in the cards. So I don't go overboard. I have an educational work website called birdphotographers.net. And some of the people are endless. Yes, you could tweak a little more detail out of the whites. And I go, leave me alone. But that's me. So yeah, saving the whites video, I think would help, help Earl out. But really to, to master this stuff, you need to get a hold of Raw Digger, learn how to use it if you want to truly master exposure. Great. Now, Paul joining us on Vimeo. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Wanted to ask you, what is the best time of year to shoot bald eagles in Homer? Well, again, it's illegal to feed them on the Homer spit. So if you go to Homer and you're not on a boat, you're not going to have a lot of success. You, sometimes we get an eagle perched outside the hotel. But when we fed them, we used to have 30 there, 40, 50. So the trick is to getting on a boat. Boats are expensive, which is why we go in a group. As far as timing, the eagles start coming at the end of October, November, December. We did a trip up there one year in November. It was nothing like February and early March. And I love my first two chips for February because you have you maximize your chance of snow. So in the winter, once it gets to be end of March, the birds are dispersing throughout uh, Alaska to nest. Great. Now, Muhammad's asking a question that I think everybody wonders at some point, and you've got some experience with. So you could definitely speak on this. He wants to know if someone were to be invested in the Canon or Nikon system with a collection of lenses, would it be worth to switch to Sony? My least favorite question. <laughs> I, I can never tell what it's worth to you because you are the only one who can determine what's worth to you. Right now, I'm using the best camera in the world as far as I know the Sony A1, with a great collection of lenses. Canon and Nikon have <clears throat> some better variety of lenses. And now Nikon's now coming out with all the Z lenses. I think this 600 is close to $16,000. So I've encouraged lots of folks to sell all their Canon and Nikon gear and switch to Sony to the A1. And every single one of them has been thrilled. But I'll say a couple of things that are really important. Every single day, folks are making great images with Canon mirrorless and Nikon mirrorless and Canon DSLRs and Nikon DSLRs. I use Sony because it's, it, to me, it's the best tools for the job right now. So when the other systems, if they come up with mirrorless bodies uh, with zebras through the viewfinder, there really won't be a, a great difference in the playing field. Not that I want to screw the use, the B and H used gear business, but I have the used gear page where you'll get more money than you'll get from B and H and be happier and try to price the stuff so that the buyers and the sellers are happy. So the other thing that I should have mentioned somewhere in this program is that <clears throat> I'm 76 years old. I'll be 77 in June, Flag Day, June 14th. And though I've taken good care of myself, there are lots of younger folks, stronger, with faster reflexes than me, stronger, with more stamina, faster hand-eye, superior hand-eye coordination, 
those folks are in better shape, in better position to take advantage of these new technologies. So a lot of folks get Sony stuff and they get a bird picture and five out of 10 pictures are on the, the neck or the wing and they go, what is this? This is junk. And it's just operator error in that we can't keep the bird in the middle of the frame. So the younger and stronger you are, the better you'll be able to use these new technologies. But the good part for me is I love getting out every day, almost every day. And I'm not done yet. I hope to keep going for, I got to beat 80 because my dad made it to 81. So I got to pass 81 or it'll be very embarrassing. Beautiful. So I'll end it with this here. Uh, Elizabeth asked if you could repeat the dates. I believe you mentioned something about a, a photo event happening in Florida. In the in the beginning, maybe I'm wrong. That doesn't ring a bell, but there's a lot of things that don't ring bell when you're seven bells when you're 76. <laughs> if she's interested in an IPT, uh, she can go to the blog and there's a little thing and it says IPT versus art IPTs and the whole schedule's there. Or she can email me at Sam and Maya's grandpa address or Burgess Art at Verizon. Awesome. Wonderful. So thanks again, Scott. I've enjoyed this. Yeah, it was a pleasure, Artie. We appreciate it. Hopefully everybody at home did. I, I think they, they asked a bunch of great questions that hopefully got answered. Uh, if you want to rewatch this, because there is a ton of information that you probably maybe didn't have an opportunity to digest, you could rewatch this. We've got it for replay available on vimeo.com, BH event space, or you can go to our Facebook page and watch this event and all the rest of them, BH event space. But that's all the time we have for tonight. Artie, thank you again for being here. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody at home for joining us. This has been another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time. Cheers.